Hi, welcome to ME313, Mechanical Engineering and Thermodynamics. The topic of this video is gas mixture PVT properties, and the section of the textbook is 13.2. So here are the learning outcomes. At the end of this, you will know Dalton's law of additive pressures, you'll know Amagat's law of additive volumes, and you'll know K's rule for pseudocritical properties. Then you'll be able to solve for PVT conditions using a gas mixture, and we'll use Amagat's law. And then at the end, I want to kind of show you uh, an example of when sometimes EES can fail. So first, let me go ahead and review Dalton's law. And let's just look at what the overarching question is that we want to answer. And is that we have a mixture of gases. And here I show a mixture of two gases. This can be any number of gases. And it's at a particular pressure, temperature, and volume. And I'm going to call that P sub M, T sub M, and V sub M for meaning of the mixture. And what we want to do is we want to be able to evaluate what these properties are, find out their relative PVT behavior. For example, given a pressure and a temperature, what is the volume? And since this is a mixture, we need to come up with some sort of mixture rules. And the first rule that we're looking at is called Dalton's Law. And Dalton's Law is the idea of additive pressures. And here's the idea. We're going to go ahead and keep the temperature and the volume the same. So we're going to have a temperature of the mixture and volume of the mixture. We're going to take just the blue molecules and put them into one bin, just the red molecules into the other bin. So now they're pure components. And then we'll go ahead and determine their properties. And we can go ahead and find a particular pressure. So for example, this would be the pressure of the blue, and this would be the pressure of the red. Clearly, those pressures are going to be smaller because the temperature and volume remain constant, but we have many, many less molecules. And Dalton's law says that those pressures, those partial pressures, need to sum up to the total pressure. So what we would write is that P sub M, the pressure of the mixture, is a summation of all of the partial pressures, where here it would be the partial pressure of the blue and the partial pressure of the red. Right. Um, this tends not to be a very good approximation when we start looking at real gas behavior, things that are not ideal gases, because what we've done by taking all of these molecules and putting them into two different bins is that we've lowered the pressure, which means that there's, each one of these is going to act a little bit more ideal than the mixture would, which means they're not going to be giving us necessarily a good representation of the pressures. Now, another um, approach we could use, which is Omegot's law. So again, remember, this is at a pressure of the mixture, a volume of the mixture, and a temperature of the mixture. <clears throat> and Omegot's law says, instead of dividing the two bins on pressure, let's take all the blue, put them into one bin, let's keep the pressure constant, and the temperature constant, and we'll just make the volume smaller. And then over here, same thing with the red, pressure of the mixture and the temperature of the mixture. But now they're going to be at smaller volumes. I can call that volume blue and volume red. And then we'll go ahead and evaluate these pure component properties. And then we can go ahead and put them together. And so this is called additive volumes, because what we're now saying is the volume of the mixture is going to be the summation of these two volumes. And this is actually a little bit better representation because by reducing the volume and keeping the pressure and temperature constant, we're going to go ahead and maintain about the same level of non-ideality in these two uh, separate boxes that we do in the middle one. So Amagat's law tends to be a better rule to use when evaluating mixtures. So um, if we were to use, uh, look at ideal gases where Z would be equal to 1, both Dalton's law and Omegot's law would give us the same result, which just says that, for example, the P sub I, this is Dalton's law, the P sub I is simply going to be the mole fraction times the pressure of the mixture. And Omegot's law would say that the volume sub I is just going to be the mole fraction times the volume of the mixture. Now, that's, that's if it was ideal, saying that Z is equal to 1. Okay. Well, that's not all that particularly interesting. What we'd like to know are real gas mixtures. What we have, what we'll look at now is a compressibility factor. And so this is of the mixture, so I'm going to put some uh, subscript M's on here, the pressure and the volume. And this is going to be a Z factor of the mixture. We're going to have to determine what that is. The total number of moles, so we will call that N submixture <coughs> and T submixture. And what we want to do now is go ahead and determine what these particular values would be. And so now we're going to have to find a value of Z. And there's a couple different ways that we can do it, either using, again, using Dalton's Law or Omegot's Law. <clears throat> and so remember, if I was to use Dalton's Law, so let's kind of look at that one here first. If I was to use Dalton's Law, we said that P sub M is going to be the summation of the P sub I's. 
And what we could do, in effect, is go ahead and determine that the value of the mixture is going to end up being equal to y sub i, z sub i, and we're going to evaluate a z at each particular value. So if we were doing Dalton's law, we would be evaluating it over here at a p sub i and a t of the mixture. And from that, we would get a z sub i. And if we were to use Amagat's law, we're going to get each particular z sub i, but we're going to use that, the pressure of the mixture and the temperature of the mixture. And that's going to give us a particular z sub i that we can go ahead and put into that equation. And so the, both of these, we're going to have a z value that we can put in there, the mixture, that's the molar average of each of the components. But where we get the value of z, depends on whether we use Dalton's law or Amagat's law, says whether we're going to go ahead and be doing it at a pressure and temperature of the mixture or a temperature of the mixture and a partial pressure. And again, just to remind you, Dalton's law tends to not be as good approximation as Amagat's law. I want to talk about one other way we can approach this, and this is called Kay's rule. And the idea here now is that, well, remember I've got, let's say we're looking at our mixture of blue and red molecules again. If this was the phase diagram of the blue, um, blue material that I have, and then on the same set of axes, I was going to put the phase diagram of the red, since it's a different material, it might be down there. Hayes rule says, well, if I have a mixture of blue and red, the mixture is probably going to be end up being somewhere in between. And so it would behave like the material that phase behavior would be there. Maybe this would be kind of a 50-50 mixture. And so the idea behind Hayes rule is that what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and weight this using the critical properties. And we'll go ahead and say, we'll define a pseudo-critical pressure, and we're going to go ahead and just do that as the mole per average of the critical pressure of each component. And we can go ahead and define a critical temperature, which is going to be the molar average, the critical temperature of each component. And so, right, we would say this dashed line is going to be more like the red, the more red there is, and closer to blue, the more like there is the blue. Doing that, I've now got two critical properties I can then define a reduced pressure, which is going to be the pressure of the mixture over the pseudo-critical, and a reduced temperature, which is going to be the temperature of the mixture over the pseudo-critical. And then from those right there, we're going to get a one value of Z sub M. So instead of um, mole averaging our Z sub M, we're molar averaging our critical properties and getting a one value of Z sub M. And this is a third approach. And you can do them in all three different ways. Kay's rule sometimes is pretty good, sometimes it's even a little more accurate than Amagat. It tends to always be better than, than Dalton. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, do an example. And so this is actually an example out of the book, because what I want to do is use EES and show you how you can approach the same problem using that. And then at the end, I'm going to show you a caveat with EES. So the problem said, this is the example out of section 13.2. We have a rigid tank and has two kilomoles of nitrogen. 6 kilomoles of carbon dioxide, so 300 Kelvin and 15 megapascals, and it wants to know the total volume. And so we're going to go ahead and approach this problem. First, I'll show you how to solve it in EES using Dalton's law. Um, I'm sorry. First, we're going to do it using Amadat's law. And then we're going to go ahead and look at Dalton's law. And we're actually, this is where we're going to see EES sort of kind of falls on its face a little bit. And I want to explain a little bit why that is. It kind of helps you understand when sometimes software tends fail. So let's go over to EES. Okay, so here I'm going to go ahead and solve an Amagat's law. And so this is actually pretty straightforward in EES. So if we look up here, I have my temperature and pressure and I've defined my unit system. And now I'm defining my mole fractions of CO2 and nitrogen, which were 6 and 2. And so then the total would be 8. And now I'm using the compressibility factor function. And when you use the compressibility factor function, spell out the material, as I've done here, carbon dioxide. Don't do CO2. If you use all um, the chemical formula like that, it's going to assume it's an ideal gas. And you don't want this. You want the non-ideal behavior. And then I'm evaluating it. Since this is Amphidots, I'm evaluating at the total pressure and temperature. And now I've got my molar average value of my compressibility, which I'm calling Z sub M. And then I'm going to go ahead and plug it in to find the volume. So this will be the extensive volume variable volume at the pressure P1, my, my value of Z. And then I can go ahead and use, since I have eight moles, I can use the universal gas constant, which is R followed by a, a hash sign, hashtag there, uh, in the ES. And that's going to put in the universal gas constant. 
and it'll put it in the unit so I have to find up in my unit system. So if we go ahead and, and solve that, well, that goes pretty quick, and you see here's our volume of 0 0.646, which is pretty close to what um, was got in the textbook or by looking it up off of off the table. Okay. So that was pretty straightforward, but now let's go ahead and look at, at um, trying to do this with Dalton's law. So let me go ahead and open up that. All right, so here's that we're going to assume the same problem, but now I'm going to solve it using Dalton's law. So I've modified this a little bit. So again, I've got the temperature and the pressure defined up at the top. Um, and again, my mole fractions, that hasn't changed. What's different is in the compressibility factor function, notice now Dalton's law, we do this at lower pressures. And so I now have this pressure, at pressure I'm calling it P sub CO2 and P sub N2. Those are the partial pressures, which are going to be somewhat lower. The next two lines are the same where I've just molar average my value for a compressibility factor and then again the total extensive volume with a, a value of use of m. Now I have these two partial pressures and remember if I took those two boxes the same volume and the same temperature but they would be a lower pressure. So now I'm going to go ahead and, and um, put in those equalities for two more equations for those partial pressures of CO2 and N2 and now again I can do this with the ideal gas constant or sorry the universal gas constant and the respective numbers of moles CO2 there was 6 um, and nitrogen there was 2. All right, so let's go ahead and attempt to solve that. And what we see is EES is having some difficulty and in fact it's not able to solve it in 250 iterations. And so the thing we want to do, if you kind of want to look at this, is just kind of give you some insight into it. Look at where the large absolute error is over here. What we see is it's down here at the bottom when it's trying to evaluate those compressibility factors for CO2 and nitrogen. Well, this is, this is a little nuanced here, but I'm going to kind of explain what you can do. Um, so what I was doing when investigating this was to find out, well, for example, what happens if I was to just increase the pressure from 15 megapascals to 2,500, 25,000, 25 megapascals, 25,000 kilopascals. And if I do that, I'm actually able to solve the problem. I've got a volume of 0.33, um, which is about maybe what I'd expect. It's about half of the volume. I've about doubled, doubled the pressure. And so that seemed to work. Um, another change I could do is increase the pressure temperature to 400 and attempt to solve that. And that seemed to work, and now I have a larger volume, which would make some sense, because, again, I've, I've increased the temperature somewhat substantially. So something's going on when I'm trying to almost do it at this particular temperature and pressure. And to go ahead and put some insight into what's going on here, what I want to do is I'm going to modify this program a little bit. And what I'm going to look at is just the compressibility factor as a function of pressure. So all that I want to do is I want to see what EES is evaluating. And so I'm going to go ahead and create a parametric table. And look at all of my variables, everything other than temperature, which is constant. And um, let me go ahead and add some runs to this, because I want to look at this over a large range of pressure. And now I'm going to just look at this as a plot of every, I'll start at 5 megapascals and increase it a megapascal. Okay, so if I look at this, and in fact these, these two partial pressures I have not, didn't need, I've no longer defined them. But if I look at the value of Z for CO2, for example, Look, it starts at 0.6, goes down pretty low, about 0.17, and then gets pretty large. Let's look at the plot of that value. So I want to look at the value of the compressibility factor. And look at this. This is what EES has. And so this is the function that it's trying to find a solution for each time. And you might recognize what that is. That sure looks like a lot like the bend in the um, compressibility chart. So I'm going to come back to my presentation. And so if you recall, if I was to look at the compressibility as a function of the reduced pressure, remember it looks something like this. And in fact, 
the very, very bottom curve, it became very, very steep. And that was at a reduced temperature of 1. Well, at this problem, we're at 300 Kelvin. And if you look at what is T critical of CO2, it is 304. And so this right over here is the reduced temperature for CO2. It's about 1. Which means here's that function, that knee function. And that's as a function of pressure here, which is exactly what I was seeing in EES. And so it's attempting to go ahead and fit this curve. And in fact, what I think it's doing is using two different functions. Um, and you see this discontinuity. And that's why it's, it's failing when it's trying to evaluate this, um, find solutions for it because it's bouncing back and forth. So what that means in essence is that sometimes software isn't going to give you the solution that you need. Um, because it's not able to fit this function very well. And this would be a problem where you just are simply going to have to go and go to the tables to get a good accurate solution.